deputy who they feel has served the community very well. Um, the council, of course, um, in starting from the beginning on the policy, uh, it's been left, because sometimes you have to get into the minutia. Some of it is, okay, what are the colors gonna be if we agree to this policy? What are the colors of the sign gonna be? I know the city of Salisbury um, inverts their color. I think they're white on green, but for this, they're green on white. So uh, the county is uh, white on black, I mean, excuse me, black on white. We can make it white on black, or could we can make it uh, county colors. We can make it blue on yellow or yellow on blue, <laughs> unless you're not too crazy about the county colors. Um, either way, uh, we would wanna, you know, I guess it would be our decision. I don't think, um, I don't think we'd have to go to public hearing or anything. It would be our decision as to what we'd like the colors of the sign to be. Uh, that can always be uh, discussed later unless anybody wants to make a comment on it now. Anybody have an opinion on this? I have, a, I have an issue with it. I, I'm wondering how that's going to be handled through a 911. Well, it doesn't replace the actual sign that's there. They stood on top of it. I understand that, but mm -hmm. what about when people are calling 911, you know, and saying, I look, you know, I'm, I'm on Jones Place. Well, Jones Place happens to be somebody's being honored. You, you see what I'm saying? And right. They actually live on Taylor Avenue or something. Is, is 9 I think we need to get it, and it might not be a problem, but I think we'd like to, I'd like to see an input from our 911 operation on yeah. on this before it's changed. I'm sure that. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I, mean, I mean, if the city's already doing it, then yeah. you know, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's a unified mm -hmm. system, so maybe you know, ask them like, how does it work for the city? Oh, yeah. Sort of. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I don't have. I think it's a great thing to do. I just yeah. want to make sure we, we're looking out for public safety too yeah. on this. Yeah. So uh, I'm hoping the council's had the chance to review this. Mm -hmm. um, any any input as far as I, th I would like to s uh, I would like to skip the policies and the criteria and the requests just now. Um, part of that's all uh, condensed in the street dedication application itself. Um, first of all, does the council want to move forward with this idea of dedicating a street sign in Lycoming <laughs> County for an individual who is uh, deemed worthy of that? Um, I'm good. I think, it's, I think it's good to have a policy. Okay. Yeah. I'm fine with it. Okay, so, so we do have... So we get that other matter straight. We're unanimous on that, right. yeah. Okay, good. Um, outside of that, uh, the, the application requires uh, um, the existing street name, the location, the historical or cultural influence of the honoree on, on the county, significant lineage or family ties to the county and or association with the county, geographical relationship of the street to the area of interest to the applicant, in other words, uh, if it is a resident in uh, Mark Kilmer's district, I, he'd probably get very upset if we put the road in Joe Holloway's district. Uh, probably. Just, so, anyway, it, it's just um, a process. So that's what the geographical represents. And then clearly defined community or public contribution made by the honoree in order to receive this distinguished honor. Um, so is there any, any part of the application that the council members uh, object to or would like to fine-tune or replace or add to? Mr. Cannon, I might just offer one thought on it. It doesn't address how the, the signs are going to be paid for. We're getting back that to could that. Be, that could be in the resolution. We're getting back to that. It does. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a little bit higher. I wanted to go to the okay. application first. All right. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. I like the application. I think it's appropriate. Covers all the bases? Okay. Everybody seems to be in agreement? Okay. Uh, going back up to the very first page again under policy, um, does anyone have any comments they'd like to make under the policy, the purpose of the program, the requests for honorary signs, and the criteria for review? That would partially include what Mr. Taylor was uh, mm -hmm. suggesting. I, I think it's a very good idea to have, um, make sure that any honorees must be deceased. I mean, sometimes you can get into the, you know, we're a bunch of politicians honoring each other, you know, and that, you know, that, that's always Sounds like a bridge. That's kind of unseemly, you know, sometimes. You know, I, I mean, I'm sorry, Larry. <laughs> I forgot about that. No, but, you, you know, we, it's better if they're, you know, to have a little distance still. You know, I think so. in most cases that will be the yeah. concern. Yeah. Um, yeah. It'll be the issue. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think okay. it's a very good idea. Okay. Does this include a, uh, having a, you know, even if it's informal public meeting or something like that or some sort of input session? If I would. Well, that's a good point, Josh. Um, Laura, I'm assuming that if when this, we're working on the nuts and bolts right now, but if the council uh, 
finds that everything here is acceptable, this would have to go forward as a resolution, and as such. <coughs> that is correct. Mm -hmm. um, it would come back before council in final form for your for your approval. Mm -hmm. And then, um, of course, the individual policy. One thing I, I didn't know if I agreed with, it's sort of um, relevant to what Josh had stated, was the request for honorary signs. It would say the dedication application would be submitted to the county council administrator. No offense to the county council administrator, but I was wondering why this wouldn't start at the executive level and then move down to the mm -hmm. council level. Because it says it goes to the administrator who then gives it to the executive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So why is it going to, you know, just have to go right to the executive office? Anybody's thoughts on that? It's legislative. Yeah. yeah. Give Wayne something more to do. <laughs> Thanks. Opinions? Leave it like it is, or do we, or do you, would you suggest that we it go to the executive branch first? It's supposed to start with the executive branch, right? Good. I would think so, yeah. Then stream, streamline it, give it to the executive branch. Okay, so we'll fix that up a little bit? I, I can change that, yes. Great, okay. Um, the, I'm gonna, it says once, this, in, under a policy down at the very bottom, it says once the sign is no longer serviceable due to age, vandalism, et cetera, it shall be removed and not replaced. I thought that was kind of I, unusual. Uh, yeah, I don't agree with that. All right. So we'll, we'll leave it in place. Uh, I recognize you're giving us something to work with here. Yeah, and you got to think about great. the cost of getting it replaced as well. Yeah, that's, that would be next. Mm -hmm. And then, um, again, the cost of this, I think, should go, because initially the cost refers to the, I believe, the county council maybe administered through the Wicomico County Council office. I think this should all be going through public works, roads. So we'll clarify that. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, it shouldn't be too much. I mean, I wonder how much the city, okay. Yeah. okay. We make the, house, the signs in house, don't right. we? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's minimal. So everybody's okay with removing the uh, not replaced Absolutely. portion? Absolutely. Okay. Somebody can knock it down the next day. Um, and then the next, uh, part is that no more than three honorary designations shall be awarded in the county during a calendar year. Didn't have a problem with that, I don't know if anyone else. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Program, uh, purpose of the program, we, I think we, um, that was explained and agreed upon in the, um, in the context of the application where it says insert cost. Um, <coughs> All supporting documentation is required at the time of the application, then along with a map of the request, a sign location, and a fee. Is there a fee, um, Councilwoman Jackson, is there a fee for the city uh, when someone applies for a, a city road sign? Not to my knowledge. All right, okay. Is there a prior? Insignificant? In Sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean that right. Oh, go ahead, Joe. Is there a process in here uh, for which if somebody doesn't want that put on their street? I mean, not everybody's going to agree. That's a good point. Public hearing? Yeah. Yeah. But the I way it's that. written now, no, that is not a requirement. I mean, you know, there's all neighbors don't get along. <laughs> <laughs> we can well, certainly have it. Yeah. 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 Like uh, does the application mention the location? Speaking yeah. of that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 I guess I'm the location. Okay, I missed just, that. And at the top. At the top of the yeah. location. Yeah. All right. Public hearing. Yeah. Public hearing. When you say yes, I'm, I'm not talking name. about a public okay. hearing about whether the bill will be passed. I'm talking about is there anything in the bill Understood. that's going to address the point of when the name's been submitted. Somebody doesn't want it on their street sign. Right. That's, so that's, the process would have to include a public hearing. We'll have to add that to the policy. Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, anything else? Criteria for review? I think Mark touched on some of that. Okay, um, all that leaves is color. Sure. Okay. Sometimes yeah, if you wouldn't mind. That'd be great. Thank you, Wayne. I really like tie dye if that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> that's a millennial down there. <laughs> okay, um, so we'll move forward with this. What's the next step? Is to put this in a formal resolution or um, another I'll work session or what? I'll work with Wayne and Mr. Taylor on getting it in final form, and okay. um, then we'll bring it back before council. All right. All right. Speed is of the essence. Am I not right? Yes. <laughs> so.
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your input, uh, Councilman Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. The. Um, lunch. Yep. We do have a request to eat lunch, so I'll have to <laughs> ask. <laughs> I heard something in the stomach. Entertain so a motion to adjourn so that we can. So or entertain a motion for a recess. We got it. Half an hour. So yeah. move. Second. All, All in favor? Okay, we are reconvening as the Wicomico County Council for Legislative Session 2019-08 for April 16, 2019. First item on the uh, work session is to discuss a summary of the changes to the capital improvement program for fiscal year 2020-2024. <coughs> Weston Young, how are you? Hey, good, good. So you all should be in receipt of a memo. President Cannon, would it be appropriate to have this work session after we meet with the school board nominees since they're scheduled to come in at one? Would you mind? I have a two o'clock at the airport, but it all depends how long you think this will take. If you don't think this will take long. You talk. Yeah. I can be quick and then we can go into more detail. My, my, my proposal is with, okay. with the individual departments, if you have specific project questions when you bring them up regarding the budget. I've got a 45 minute presentation. All right, we'll try. Hey, your, your call. Uh, All right, let's, let's, let's go ahead and move forward, and uh, we, we appreciate okay, that. I'll, I'll let's move forward. I'll be quick. Thank um, you, Thank you, Wesley. So, and, and we're going to get this revised CIP on the website. I did notice when I was flipping through it earlier today that there were some changes made to the airport projects that were not included in the memo, and that is a mistake on my part, but um, I figure I'll just read down it. Um, we originally submitted the CIP December 18th, uh, 2018, and uh, we have since revised it during the budget process. Uh, in some cases, as I mentioned earlier, when um, Steve Miller was up here, we've proposed using existing PAYGO as a funding source, as well as we've pushed some projects out um, a year. Sometimes it's just the first phase of the project, or sometimes the entire project, a multi-year project, has all been shifted one year, and I'll, I'll try to touch on all of those. <clears throat> Uh, so general changes to the CIP, um, we have added an existing PAYGO category that if you look at um, the specific page that shows projects by funding source, it's page two, um, numbered page two, not PDF document page two. Um, the green color shows existing PAYGO appropriations, so this is just, as mentioned before, this is old PAYGO money that we're uh, reappropriating through this uh, proposed document. I like that a lot. Yeah, I noticed that the other to, night. It's very to good. To separate it. Um, yep. We added an emergency services project, and I can touch on that project as we get down. Um, one change, we, we've historically added $200,000 
uh, to contingency in the bond, a combination of having two projects so that we're bonding seven million for Beaver Run and we're borrowing two million, which I'll touch on the West Side Collector. Um, and given there's just two projects, when you have 10 projects, you usually want that contingency there because one of them could go off. Um, and we're also, um, the, the bond market, uh, we're still in a period where they'll provide bond premium. So in the competitive uh, bidding process of our bonds, we sometimes get additional money that can be spent. So we could use that as contingency. Um, I've also tried to rank these projects by department number. Uh, there were some like the public safety building was listed at the bottom of the list and, and tried to correct that. So if there's no questions there, I'll go department by department. <clears throat> General services, we, we added a project that is for this building and it's for finance and the customer service counter renovation. This is to redo um, the counter they have and it also adds uh, bullet resistance to it and we're proposing to fund that through existing PAYGO. Where's this? Uh, when you pay your county taxes, finance. yeah, finance. So it's that front, or it's and a bulletproof vest. It, it, it's bullet resistant. Wow. Um, it's it's common practice. You know, the city's done something similar with theirs, and we're trying and to finance. modernize it. Yeah, and now's the time to do that. Um, so the city is on board with all this. Uh, well, this is this is this, county. This is ours. Yeah, this is county fully. What they've um, done is what Steve. Yeah. With the government office building, if there's common areas, we get the city's buy-in prior right. to putting in, and I think we've communicated better than before uh, with this CIP with, with the city. So they should have in their capital plans their half of the common projects for this building. This being purely county finance, that's all us. Right. Oh, you're talking the finance department. Right? Yes. Yeah, it's... Um, so, so you mean you, you're going to put the same kind of glass in that they have in, in the... City, yes, yeah, we're, we're going to mimic mimic how they've upgraded theirs, and we're also going to make the um, more of a workstation up at the window, so that they don't have a separate desk. It frees up more space, and they're always at the front window as well. So is that the only area that's going to get this bulletproof protection? <clears throat> that's my understanding. Is yeah, okay, right now. Um, <clears throat> then with general services, there were three projects that we simply just changed their funding source um, that they were originally put in as general PAYGO and we plan to use existing PAYGO. Should what we talked about earlier today be in this? If, if we decide to wait, we will add that to the recreation, parks and tourism as a, as a change. Um, <clears throat> To IT, uh, we, they had one project in FY21, and it was originally um, color-coded to be old bond money, when in reality it was old bond proceeds, and we, or sorry, old PAYGO. Mm -hmm. And I was still reading the sentence. So it's not, it's not planned to be funded with old bonds. It's planning to be funded with old PAYGO. That's a year out. Um, the public safety building, the second half of the sheriff's um, building has been moved from FY20 to FY21, and we think from construction um, we're able to do that, um, and that'll be fine. <clears throat> For the Department of Corrections, uh, the roof replacement project we moved one year, and the flooring upgrade project, which had money all, f all five years, we removed FY20s. The other four years remain the same. How does the uh, public safety building, that, is it the sheriff's department, right? Yes. How does that impact our, our expenses, our, our interest expenses on the bond? Will that extend the, the term of the bond or not? Um, so so the, I guess the plan was is to have two separate bonds to fund this. We had first half of the project bonded this year. Oh, okay. Um, and okay. we think by the time um, we start construction and we need that second half of the money, we're going to be in FY21. Okay. So, it, so doesn't, it doesn't create any more expense? We don't think expense. so. No. Um, <coughs> emergency <coughs> services, I mentioned we added a project. Um, this is one that We've done a major radio upgrade, but the siren system 
and the old pagers, there's still some they call Minotaur. Larry may be familiar with it. He may yes. have one. Yeah. So, so that pager right now that, that Larry has in his hands, um, in certain areas of the county, you're not getting full service. Um, with emergency services, we try to have redundant systems. So like even with the public safety building, the communication line that comes in, there's going to be two. So you basically pay double the cost. But if something happens, if one gets cut, you still have communications with the other one. Um, so so, so this, would this deal with some of the issues they've had down in like bivalve, the kind of the west side? Yeah, Sharptown, bivalve, it, it, with those specific pagers, the VHF frequency, um, this is adding two new antennas to towers to help close the gap. Um, the new radios that have been issued, those are, those are perfectly fine right now. But um, so we added that project and we're proposing to fund that with existing PAYGO. Um, public Works, I'm going to lump all them together even though their department numbers vary a bit. Uh, the WIP, where we do 200000 every year, uh, that's still unchanged except the funding source for FY20 will be existing PAYGO. So we have this existing PAYGO, let's use it for that. And then we reduce the Wicomico River dredging support for FY20 from half a million to 35, I'm sorry, 350,000. So that's a $150,000 uh, decrease. Is the existing pay go on the whip because we didn't do anything last year? We had the 200? No, this is using other monies. Instead of using FY20 revenue to pay for it, we reallocated existing pay go. We're, we're using the whip. Existing pay Yes, but from other projects. See, that's what we had a thing in here about. I mean, when we approve a project, we approve sure. that project. I don't, we don't approve a project for one project, and then because then, for all we know, you, you know, we could have a project for similar to what we saw today. You got a project that's you're telling us is 400, sure. turns out to be 200, but you just slide that 200 over to another project that's now 600 instead of 400, and it's hard for us as an, a body of oversight to be able to determine. To be able to determine exactly how much we're spending for what and where the overcost might be and where the short. I, I think it would be helpful to have a list of where this existing pay goes coming from, what what projects it's it's tied to, but we're still seeking your approval to reallocate right. this money. So that's the the funds get encumbered, John, and they get placed in this fund 32. Uh, it can roll for three years. At the point in time that we want to repurpose the funds, we have to come back to you and go through the process. Mm -hmm. So what, what Weston is proposing here is that <clears throat> projects that may have, have been abandoned uh, or may have come in at a lower cost, um, we're, we're proposing that instead of those funds staying idle and or lapsing back into the general fund, we want to repurpose those for current projects. But it still goes through the legislative process. So we're just bringing it back to you. Yeah, and I appreciate that it's coming back here. It's just, um, yeah. well, it's kind of like Weston said, it'd be good to have a list of sure. where sure. the money's coming from. So, sure. you know, so then we sure. can say, all right, you, know, you didn't yeah. spend on. True, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, yeah. once we pass it the first time, we think it's a done deal and the money's, you know, it's. I mean, it's open up. Uh, believe me, I mean, uh, I don't think this has been something that, Joe, I don't think you're familiar with transferring existing PAYGO over the years that you've been on the council. And I know I have, and Bill, um, from the few years think, you've done. Well, I think it would be helpful. I mean, you just tell us where it came sure. from. Sure, yeah, I, mean, I think it creates so. a, a certain amount of, I don't know, I don't know the right word to use, maybe suspicion when we are passing the capital budget. That if, if we see enough of this, we say, well, is it really going to cost that much to do this? You know, because... You know, two years ago, you had $400,000 left out of a $700,000 project. So, you know, and over time, I think that's going to that's gonna build up and just create an air of um, suspicion. Well, I think that's why the three-year limit is in yeah. there, Joe, so that, that, that if, in fact, and I don't think we ever intentionally pad, and we put the department heads through a pretty rigorous process mm -hmm. in terms of defending, hey, why do you want this much money? Where did you come up with that number? And still sometimes it's wrong. But I think that's why the three-year limit is there, so that uh, it can't just stay there in perpetuity, that it, at some point in time it's got to it's be resolved. It goes okay. back to general fund. Okay. Do we approve that going back to general fund? Yes, sir. Well, it would automatically lapse back into general it fund after three years. So we, we don't yes, know that it goes back to if general it was, fund. If it was bonded back to what Mr. Taylor said earlier, uh, that 
once the entire bond issue is completed, and it's got to be the whole bond issue. So once all that's completed, if there are funds left, we've got the choice of paying down debt, uh, putting the money back into the general fund, or repurposing the money <coughs> for appropriate projects. But it still has to come back through the legislative process. And, and Did I get that right, Bob? Well, I'm not sure all about those? it coming back to the general fund. That's the only thing, Wayne, because it doesn't say that in the charter. Now, whether that would be something that essentially is just common sense, even though it doesn't say mm -hmm. in the charter, I, I don't know. But it sounds like in well, the charter it stays in the capital budget for some other projects. Uh, just, it, you know, it, it could. could. Where, we yeah. really, where we really have to be very careful are the, are, are the yeah. Board of Education projects because yeah. – we don't have direct knowledge of whether or not a project is complete, if there are payments that are still outstanding, yeah, this, that, and the other. So we query them on an annual basis as to are all of your projects that were in this bond issue completed or are there still outstanding mm -hmm. issues? Right. Once they mm -hmm. say, yep, you've got a green light, that's when we've got to repurpose those funds. So mm -hmm. I think for sake of clarity, when we – reach that resolution or reach that point where funds should be repurposed, then I think we should come back to council. I think that's the no, cleanest way yeah. to do it. I mean, I think as a general matter, since we have so much capital expenditure anyway, Correct. the idea of it going back into the general fund is nice, but from a practical standpoint, unnecessary. Yeah. I, and I really, I do I really appreciate you itemizing all this because mm -hmm. if you didn't, we wouldn't know. Sure. Um, sure. I'm assuming, though, or is there going to be a time period where we're going to uh, approve individually all these transfers because this is just a work session? Um, my, my understanding is this is still a draft document. It mm -hmm. hasn't been approved yet. Right. So, you know, if, as long as you guys have, are okay with what the final draft is and we right. need to add the project or projects we spoke about with, with Steve Miller and my memo needs to reflect a few other changes that I've, I've caught I didn't, right. I didn't add. Well, when you approve um, the CIP, you really, th this is blended into it. So if you approve the use of the funds, right. then you're really approving the movement of those funds. So there are really <coughs> three points here. One, that the PAYGO portion, the current year PAYGO portion is approved through the budget cycle. The borrowing is approved through the bond cycle. Right. The repurposing of existing PAYGO funds that for all intents and purposes are lying idle um, would come, I, I, I would think would come through yeah. the approval of the CIP. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, yeah I think so too. Yeah. And just another observation on that, by keeping the uh, surplus funds from uh, completed and abandoned projects in the capital budget, it's essentially like it's going back into the general fund because that much less new PAYGO is it's needed. So it winds up the same, you come out the same place. And, and, yeah. and, and further to that, Bob, we're repurposing the funds for the original intent of capital improvements. Yeah, right. As opposed to putting the funds back into the general fund and right. using it for some other purpose. It yeah, I mean, essentially, since money's fungible, it's like you're putting it back anyway. So, so could it, in actuality, could, should it get your mic to you? Should it ever go back into the general fund, um, being it's borrowed money, if it's bonded money? Well, if it's borrowed money, um, I think it would, I'll have to check. Yeah. yeah. I'll have to check. I think there it would go I'll back to, check to legal on for the bond, yeah, pay down yeah. the bonds. I'll have yeah. to check legal on that, yeah. uh, Joe. You know, I asked a long time ago when we were having road issues, you know, right. why didn't we buy money? And it was always uh, all borrowing money, I'm sorry. Uh, it was always, I don't know if it was embedded in the county that we didn't borrow money to fix roads. But if you're actually putting this money back into the general fund and that money is going to do other projects, it's, it is borrowed money. So, and, it, and, and, and that, in fact, Joe, might disqualify those bonds from a tax exempt status, so mm -hmm. we should be careful with that. We we don't borrow money for maintenance of roads because it doesn't qualify for tax exempt bonds. New construction mm -hmm. does. Yeah, we've seen how that <coughs> happened down in Allen, right? Huh? Never mind. I said we've seen how that happened in Allen that time. Yeah. Sorry. to fix that road. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that 
concluded Public Works Engineering. Public Works. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. No, I. Public Works Roads, um, we removed the equipment storage shed and dry storage building um, that were both proposed for FY20. They were smaller amounts and they were needed to complete projects from uh, previous year and a uh, combination of value engineering helped um, get those costs down. So we, we figured that out so we don't need that additional money so we removed that. Um, we have, as, as a uh, surprise to everyone, we have moved uh, the West Side Collector Phase 3. Uh, we had put it in an out year, so fiscal year 2023, and we've proposed it for fiscal year 2020. Um, the thought is with that, when we sat down and really dug into those plans where they've been there for a while, we think we can get significant drainage improvements in that area as well. Crooked Oak, um, you know, and, and the that area, um, we think we can we can do that. And if the state keeps letting Nanticoke Road wash out, um, it's helpful to have that extra um, path for for our citizens to take. Yeah, I've gotten a lot of people made that comment saying this Correct. road were completed it would make things easier when sure. Pemberton washes out. And That's why we're supposed to wash out. So and yeah, you. you conveyed that to us, and that was you know one of the. And, and what we think we can do drainage-wise to help out that, that area, I think, um, would be a net positive. Uh, we then also added uh, three bridges, Bridge and Willards, um, and we plan to use um, general fund PAYGO. So this is an existing PAYGO. This is regular uh, FY20 PAYGO and a state grant. Uh, there's, there's bridge improvement funds out there, and we pay forget if it's 5% of that or 10% of that, and they cover the rest. Um, is, is that going to be replaced with a bridge or tiles? Um, I think that's going to be a bridge, a full bridge full replacement. Bridge. The, the ones where we have found putting tiles, pipes, and getting it off the bridge inventory, we try to do that. So Bear Swamp and um, there's one other that yeah, well, comes to mind. I'm drawing a blank. Um, for Public Works Solid Waste, uh, we got an updated cost estimate on the emergency generator, so we've reduced that from 250000 to 200000 and we've pushed out the landfill cell 7 construction from FY 2021 to 21 22, so that's been shifted a year. Uh, Weston? Yes. I thought um, solid waste was self sufficient. I didn't think we borrowed money for that. Is that. Um, we still show. Uh, solid waste. If you go to numbered page four, mm -hmm. um, we do not borrow money. Mm -hmm. This is this is just purely. We, we still show the capital projects. Yeah. But why is um, it being pushed off? I guess maybe that's my. Oh, um, we think with uh, cell nine reaching completion, we'll have time. Um, and having a recent cell being built, we have a better idea on time frame. <clears throat> so we, we think we can wait until... So it's um, a matter of money. Yeah, it's right. not a matter of money. Right. Um, it does help us. We can save more in the process. Um, and uh, so we're going to push design off till 21 and then construction in 22. But that's a good question. Um, next, with Board of Education, and we met with um, Dr. Hanlon and her staff yesterday to clarify these things. Um, the Beaver Run project, we made some changes. We're not uh, proposing um, nine million in the first two years. We're, pro we're proposing seven million and then adding um, four million to the last year. Uh, this, this spreads it out more evenly over three years. And um, I think it was beneficial to have uh, the MAKO staff here talking about Kerwin. Um, until we know exactly how the dust is going to settle on that, uh, we have reservations about committing to um, another building and just having it in the pipeline. So we've, we've I want to, the official statement is we have put the Mardella High Middle project on hold until we have a better idea as to what Kerwin, the $15 minimum wage, and potential recession. Um, is going to do well on the be on the beaver run issue that said so they're okay with cutting it back to seven that's not going to hold hold up the project any I, I guess my thoughts were if they had the plans drawn 
They knew how long it was going to take. They were figuring on spending $9 million each year. That's not going to affect them any? Or? Uh, they're also getting a significant portion from the state each uh -huh. year. And we, were, we think their concern was possibly in that last year. In the last year. In, in FY22, so, in, so, so in the next CIP, we may need to do more than seven, uh, but we're, we're working with their staff. They were going to calculate that and, and get back to us, but, but, but we're- But it doesn't slow the project. Okay. No. Right. Yeah. So they can get started, um, and the seven million is enough to get them started. And as I mentioned, uh, Mardella High Middle, the study and planning for that is- um, on pause. <clears throat> the, uh, with the Beaver Run, how do we know everything's going to be so great in fiscal year 22 that's going to dovetail where we can add $4 million to the project in that exact year? Well, you don't want to start the school and then stop. have to stop it. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. So that's the reason that we're being a little bit, ca a little bit cautious about Mardella because, again, with what you heard this morning from, um, from Mako, um, it, it, it will probably be when we enter the CIP cycle again next year and start the budget cycle where we're going to have a clear idea of just how bad it's going to get in terms of things cascading down from the state. I, I, I'm personally still very concerned about the statewide shortfall in Board of Education OPEB. I mean, I forget what the number is, but it's an astonishing number. And if the state doesn't have money for Kerwin and they're taking a write down already and they have a structural deficit, where's the money going to come from to bring OPEB coverage up to some reasonable level? Right. I don't know where that money comes from. I, I hate to say I'm hanging her hat on gambling proceeds. I, th I board, think you know. I, I thought you made an excellent point, Joe, because I, I can see for all kinds of reasons. I, I would anticipate that casino revenue. Uh, it, it is possibly going to um, to weaken because of competition, because of economic factors, because of you know online. Game. I mean, all kinds of reasons why physical casinos may not be bringing in as much uh, revenue as currently they are. So uh, it, it kind of made you feel like uh, they were thinking that it was recession proof. You know, casinos are recession proof. <laughs> I don't, think, uh, I don't think that's that's the situation. Uh, I, I don't know. It it it's it's a worry that you know the the state finances are are a concern and the state spending commitments are yeah. a concern. It'll cascade down in some fashion. Uh, another thing, looking in the out year and and the four million dollar increase to that um, our borrowing capacity goes up significantly more in the out years so we yeah, we, we could were, yeah yeah that does make sense and our borrowing this year just a forecast on the budget the borrowing that we've anticipated and the interest uh, that we've anticipated the interest rate we've anticipated brings us in at about ten and a half percent on P&I so we're That's point low. and a half below the That's policy low, yeah. limit. So it's given us some headroom as we go out. We did that intentionally. Mm -hmm. um, moving on, uh, we made no changes to the proposed Warwick or library projects uh, that were put in the document for the health department, public health. Um, the hurdle building replace carpet project has been moved from FY20 to FY21. We moved that out a year. Um, <clears throat> on the airport, this is where I realized I didn't record all the changes I made, and I'm going to have to go back and, and do that. Um, <clears throat> the old terminal building rehab, uh, we pushed the design part of that 82,000 out a year. Uh, we, we pushed a rehab access control system out a year and a main terminal HVAC system controls out of year. Um, the air traffic control tower uh, equipment has been pushed out from 2021 to 21-22. Uh, the FEMA cargo joint use distribution center has been moved out a year. That's a three-year project, so 2021-22 has gone to 21-22-23. Uh, we then added three projects that uh, we've been talking with USDA Rural Development 
um, which include box hangers, a corporate hanger, as well as uh, the ARF station we're looking at getting fully grant funded. Um, USDA will pay for ARF? Um, a building? They, it's included in their community facilities program is my understanding, but there's also, um, I think uh, FAA is is another funding source. So okay. it's sort of getting under discretionary funds. Dawn, Dawn would be better to go into the details and on what that. what will happen with the existing building? Um, they're in a hangar they're right now hangar. that we would we intend to move to another location. So you're not going um, to tear the hangar down? No, we no. move that hangar across so campus. be available right. for lease? Right. Yes. Good. Yes. Um, and back to the terminal, can I ask sure. one more question? You're going to be building a new restaurant? No. No. We haven't. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's supposed to be on the news tonight. Well. <laughs> Who'd they talk to? Well. They didn't talk to me. Here's. <laughs> Here's what could theoretically happen. Didn't you just um, a a <laughs> restaurant owner um, could very well do a land lease with us and build their own restaurant. And that's probably what she's looking at. Um, that's, that's. Do you all communicate much? Yeah, we communicate <laughs> weekly. We communicate weekly. Um, so um, there's probably a few other. Um, airport changes in terms of years being pushed out um, and I'll clarify that in a supplemental memo providing where the PAYGO monies are coming as well as um, adding the recreation parks and tourism. Um, they did have a few changes so that's the last uh, group of departments I, I wish to discuss with you all. Um, there was a Harmon Field fencing project scheduled for FY20 that's been removed and we've replaced that with sh uh, Shoemaker parking lot replacement phase two. And um, that will be funded through a combination of general fund pay go and a state grant, very similar to how Harmon Field fencing was. And then a project uh, Steve will be excited to tell you about is what we call um, the Henry S. Parker Athletic Complex Field seven and a half. And details should be in this. But this is a, um, a special ball field that will allow people who cannot physically normally play on a traditional little league or the softball challenger. team. Challenger. Yeah, challenger. Challenger field. Challenger yeah. field. And um, a part of that funding, we're looking at getting donations. And he's already made huge headways, and it hasn't been fully announced yet. So we've added that project with what we think it would cost um, the county. but. Depending on the donations that come in, um, we can we can likely reduce that amount further. He's presenting that concept to the chamber, I think, on Thursday. Is he not, Weston? I think so. At yeah. the uh, legislative. It's it's a um, it's a really great idea. So that, in general, are the changes. Um, I do owe you all, as I mentioned, a supplemental memo, just to catch if there's anything else. I miss um, include the PAYGO projects and the history where, where that money was coming from and um, then add the project unless, unless there's a time sensitive issue with what Steve was proposing earlier, uh, I can add that to the mix. So those are in summary the, the changes made from the December submittal. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I really like what you're doing because you know it's a project in motion, and you seem to be adapting and adjusting really well. And a lot of conservative measures I think you're taking. Um, the, the only concern I have, and I never understood why there were so many stages in the CIP. You know, it's like back in November we have to start thinking about it. We have public hearings, and then we move on, and we approve one stage. And say, I never understood why I just part of the process did it. What, what, I, what this leads me to wonder sometimes is that where we are now with what's being put on the table today is that maybe the individuals that came to the public hearing back in November or December, it's not the same CIP that it was back then. Mm -hmm. And I'm really wondering what is the significance of going through this long process when it's never, it's never the same from one month to the next, you know? And I, a planning document's one thing, and I recognize the it. The planning part is, is but, one thing. But it's, it's like, it's so unpredictable that it's, it's hard to even call it a planning document now. In a good way of what you're doing, you're doing great stuff, but I'm, my concern mm -hmm. again I is understand. back in November and December, those people that wanted a 
not that many people came, right. but those that are very <laughs> anxious about a CIP <laughs> yes. and really want to know what's going on, they're going like, wait a minute, I didn't know that this, sure. 23, no, it's 22, 25, no, it's 26. Yeah. Everything seems upside down, so I don't know, I don't, I don't know, I'm not, I don't know if I'm asking a question or not. You know? yeah. You're suggesting we put the CIP off a few months ago, a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting we um, delay the public hearing more? Or mm -hmm. I don't know if the whole date? process. The yeah. whole process just seems. Yeah. Well, I, I yeah, think I'm, not, I'm not sure we even have a choice with that. I think we've got to follow. revisit the charter. And right, the charter, right? Because you know, it takes the charter lays yeah. out, the, mm -hmm. you know, the time frame. I never quite understood it either, John. But it was in the charter, and I said, okay, I'll mm -hmm. do it. In some respects, we are starting too early for the budget year mm -hmm. uh, because we don't know how finances are going to fold right. in. We don't know the revenues. But in terms of the long-term planning, you've got a fairly good idea of what you want to get done with long-term planning. It's that it's it's that budget year, and it's the initial year of any significant project mm -hmm. that really gets your attention. And you don't know at that point in time how much you can or can't afford in that first year. Right. So it's it's a little bit of a it's it it's very fluid. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're doing this year makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You know, hit the pause button. Oh yeah. Take a breather, revisit it, and get more comfortable with particularly that first year and any significant project that we're going to take on that will have consequences in the planning years. So. I'm much more comfortable with this year's cycle than I have been in the past. I think we should put it closer to our budget every year. I think you're right. Well, I would agree with that, Joe. I certainly wouldn't be sweating as much, as, as much uh, in December. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Correct. okay, sure, go ahead. You know, let's let's look at it again in May. Sure. Right. Uh, well, I mean, I think it's about time to have a charter review committee formed anyway. That might be something. I agree to with that, too. Throw to them to look at. And, you know, I've had 10 more years of experience looking at, you know, yeah. stuff. So. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent idea. Well, you also got to remember, though, the purpose of it in December. The purpose is it's got to be, you can't do anything that's not in the CIP plan. So it's projects that you're... Yeah, it's got to conform to your... Right. It's got to be in there whether you end up doing it or not doing it, but it has to be in the right. plan. It's, it's got to be in the plan or you can't do it. Right. Right. But uh, I, li I liked all this. I mean, the initiative that you're taking, the, the clarifications that you're making, uh, it's, it's making it a lot easier for everybody to recognize where we're heading. So, again, I apologize. The, the memo was, the intention of the memo was to include all the changes, and, and I see at least three that, that didn't make it. So I'll, um, again, provide a supplemental memo and try to pull all the other information that's been uh, discussed. And... Uh, and I don't think the pages are numbered. Mine, they Look at the very bottom right. They're, they may be tiny. I think it's jumping before I get to oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be it. PDFs will do that. If you print it out, you should, you okay. should see it. They're there. Thanks, and thanks for the color coding, though. That definitely it does help. That it helps a lot. Help. Yes, sure. Yeah. It's just come a long way in yeah, the last four help. years. Yeah. My gosh. Yeah. Mr. President, yes. going back to your question about the public hearing, um, council had the public hearing per the charter requirement back in February, um, but that was before these changes were made. Mm -hmm. um, are you thinking that since we have this many changes that we should have a, another public hearing on this document? I don't think so. Hmm? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, it's the question as That's to whether or not deal, it's not substantially not. making that big a difference to the overall impact right. of the county and the funding, et cetera. And we'll think about it. Okay. Or do we have to think about it now? Um, the adoption of the CIP was um, extended to June the 4th, so we do have some time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, we'll, we'll think it over. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's a good well, question. I mean, you could have it as part of the revenue budget hearing on May 7th. You could fold it into that. Just fold it, just say, if That's you have comments idea. on this capital plan, have it at the same mm -hmm. time. They're two separate documents, though, so keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but if you... But that, that's, I like that we idea. Could take comments but it's only one at the beginning. Up, but sure. yeah. It doesn't matter, right. Okay. Right. two separate hearings. Right. What he said. <laughs> what he said. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Great, thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much. Thanks. item we have on the agenda of course is uh, for the um, Board of Education 
uh, District 3 interviews. How's everyone? We're Gaines Hawkins and Tanya Laird Lewis. Um, Gaines, I think what we'll do is have you come up first, okay? We have you listed first on the agenda. I guess it was alphabetical order. But um, we'll do that. We'll do one at a time instead of having you both sit up here and just you can relax there, and Gaines will let you get started. How's that? Then, then, then she'll know what we're going to ask. Yeah. She gets the advantage. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Roll? Yes. Be my guest. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, I am Gaines Hawkins, a candidate for the District 3 Wacomico School Board vacancy. Uh, you, I think you have a longer background piece that I uh, submitted. This will be considerably shorter. I am the son of teachers college graduates, husband of White Wicomico County teacher. All four of my children are products of public schools, each graduating from Parkside. Three are now college graduates. I went to public schools, graduated from the Uni University of Maryland College Park, moved to Salisbury in 1966, and retired six years ago after a 33-year career in higher education administration, 23 <coughs> years at Salisbury University and 10 years at UMES. I believe a first-rate public school system is vital to the economic, social, and cultural future of Wacomico in a 21st century that places an increasing value on having a highly educated workforce. Wacomico is blessed with, with what I call our community's four pillars. Salisbury University, one of the nation's best regional universities. PRMC, cited by Health Grades, is one of the best 250 hospitals in the country. Purdue Farms, ranked 89th by Forbes in its list of America's largest private companies. And the Wicomico River, a sublime natural resource that benefits all, us in myriad ways. The foundation for our future, though, is our public school system. It should be our highest priority to ensure it's not simply the best we can afford, but rather simply the best. Wacomico's future success hinges on be becoming recognized as a smart community, a community, community that publicly embraces the importance it places on an excellent public school system. I found, find fulfillment in being an active participant in a community, a cu community with a shared commitment to the common good. I feel I can make a contribution to our community as a member of the school board team. Thank you. Did you have a presentation as well, similar? Just a similar introduction. Okay, I'll, why don't you come up and we'll let you do that and then we'll ask questions, the council will ask questions of you both at the same time. So it's the first time we've done this too. <laughs> We're all new to this. We're all learning together. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How's everyone? Great. This is an odd position, but I will attempt to make eye contact with all individuals throughout my introduction. It's just habit. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, Tanya Laird Lewis. I am currently a stay at home mom and an active substitute in uh, Wicomico County. I am highly involved. I am a dedicated parent within the county. My um, Career objective is to maintain a positive and collaborative and cooperative relationship with this, within the schools, the board officials, and Wicomico County Council and city members. To enhance my educational and professional skills in an environment which advocates for the learning and safety for children. Um, for those of you who have had me um, speak before, you are well aware that it is all about the children. It is about what we can do to make the environment they are in conducive, effective, and to create wonderful individuals that are going to go out into society and they're going to become scholars and they are going to be beneficial to the work environment. Um, I also attended University of Maryland Eastern Shore um, where I earned a degree in biology and I played there on the softball team. Also, the requirements for a master's in teaching were gained there as well. Things that I can offer to Wicomico County, strong collaborator, leadership skills, effective time management, ability to work under pressure, 
positive attitude, the willingness to adapt, creative and logical thinking skills. One of the main things I would like to do if I am selected to be in this position is to increase the open lines of communications between the schools and the Wicomico County Board of Ed. And my intention is to do that by reaching the parents where they are. We have multiple students with multiple learning levels. We have the parents who have those same exact levels. We need to do what we can to make them aware of the concerns and issues that are going on in the county in a situation at which they can understand. Um, we need to, I have, lot, I have so many things. I'm, I don't wanna take up all the time, but I have so many things that I, I would love to bring to the table. Um, we have a committee for the county. It's called the Parent Advisory Committee. I'm the school representative for both Willards and Pittsville to the Board of Ed currently. The parents trust me. They come to me with issues and concerns. They confide information in me at which I can relay to administrators as well as board officials to, hope, to hopefully take care of some of the issues that are occurring in our schools. Um, I know you watch the news. I know you're well aware of the critical issues we have going on right now in our county. They're alarming. The factors that are occurring with discipline in our county are alarming. And one of the things we need to do is make sure that we are upholding the guidelines of the code of conduct. We need to be holding our children accountable. We need to be holding their parents accountable because yet again, our goal here is to create scholars, not to create conflicts. And I feel that being able to have a cooperative relationship with parents is going to head off some of the alarming factors that we are currently dealing with in the county. And let's see. I'm sure you're gonna ask some other questions that are gonna sure. deal with many of the other points that um, I would like to bring up, so. All right, well, thank you very much. You're very welcome. What I would suggest, council members, and let me know if you think this would work. If you have a question, uh, we'll direct the question first to Mr. <coughs> Hawkins, and then the, um, um, and then I guess the council could ask that one question and then to Ms. Lewis with the same question. And then the next time we would rotate it where Ms. Lewis would be asked the question first from Mr. Hawkins. Uh, and that way it could be a kind of a fair balance. Um, who would like to start, Larry? Yeah, um, I, my question really only pertains to Ms. Lewis, so that's okay. Oh. You mentioned the MAT. Did you get the MAT? Um, I actually went through the program and um, was hired in Wicomico County. They put you on a provisional <laughs> certificate. Um, I missed the test by one point. Okay. And then my husband and I got married. We started a heating and air business, um, had two children, and I actually went back um, to um, do all the coursework mm -hmm. and put all of that up to date. And UMES does not have a uh, collaborative unit currently with Wicomico County, and UMES would not, or Wicomico County would not accept any of the prior coursework for me to go through um, and reinstate that certificate. Wasn't there a collaboration with Salisbury University as well? There is one with Salisbury, um, but it's what your home school is, where you enroll, and I received my Bachelor's of Biology from University of Maryland Eastern Shore, so that's where the bulk of my credits were from. So um, Dr. Briggs um, and Brian Regner actually went with me very extensively. We went to UMES, um, we had meetings, we met with uh, members of the Board of Ed to try to get this process going. And Briggs actually, Dr. Briggs actually brought me on board um, to fill in a long-term science position sure. for him at Bennett High School. So we made multiple attempts to do that, but the, the bond that the county has with UMES is not as strong as it is with Salisbury when it comes to those academic credits and extensions in things of those sorts. That's interesting. Thank you. Any other question? Um, Joe, Mr. Hawkins, mm -hmm. and I guess both, both of them. We know that we have a really bad discipline problem in our schools, and um, we keep hearing that hands are tied because of the, was it Department of Justice ruling, I think it was, yeah. where basically they can't 
um, expel some students, can suspend some students. Where do you, where do you see that as being a solution to that problem? Um, and, and nobody else knows it, so I don't expect <laughs> you to <but laughs> get your opinion anyway. I'm not, not going to offer a solution, yeah. and uh, yeah. and and I, you know, I I've talked to some uh, former uh, board members, and what they told me was, you don't realize how much you don't know about the uh, school system until you become a board member. Mm -hmm. So I say that up front, so I'm yeah. not privy to a lot of the background in, in terms of uh, discipline issues and uh, the challenges that uh, many of our parents, faculty, and administrators, and students face. Yeah, I think this, this pre-K program could actually be a benefit. Again, I'm an old guy, but I remember the discipline problems uh, that, I, <coughs> that I experienced when I was uh, school age, elementary, and it was it's usually from kids who didn't want to be there. You know, kids don't want to be in school, and it's a variety of reasons. It wasn't so much maybe drugs and single parent homes back then, but kids didn't feel confident uh, in school, and so they would act out accordingly. And, uh, you know, I got in my fair share of playground tussles with, with other kids, but you know, the, more, the more we can bring kids into, uh, into, into the classroom at an earlier rate, age and enhance their confidence when they enter, and so when they're, because many of these kids that aren't confident in school, nobody's reading to them before they get to school. So I think uh, I am very hopeful that the earlier we get kids into a classroom, exposed to uh, reading, increase their confidence, put them in a social environment which expects them to behave, uh, you know, I, th I think that uh, could yield some positive outcomes. I, I would suggest you could expand on that as well, um, your sure. position as far as pre-K is concerned, because that is, as you know, the high. That wasn't the question. Well, the question was, the question was discipline. discipline, but I'd also like to hear your question on your response to pre-K. On the pre-K? Okay. Yeah, put it all together. Uh, I was going to say, where would you like me to begin? Well, it was Joe's question, so we'll start with it. Discipline? Okay. Um, actually, that is one of my most critical issues that are facing Wicomico County currently. Discipline, it's the practice of training to obey. And yes, the training is going to begin in pre-K when you expose them to following rules and guidelines, being around other individuals out of a small daycare setting, out of the comfort of being home with grandparents and out of the comfort of being home with, with their parents. However, if you look the definition up, it also says to obey rules or a code of conduct and using punishment to correct the disobedience. And I feel that that currently is where the, the county is lacking. We have a code of conduct for a reason. We need to make sure that we are following the rules and the procedures in the code of conduct when we're disciplining a student. We need this. Students need this. Teachers need this. Staff needs this. And sometimes the parents need this. As a county, standing strong, we need to be enforcing discipline. Are we backing down currently with the guidelines for the Department of Justice? Yes, we are. Because if we were addressing these issues when they first start to arise, following the code of conduct, then it's not going to accelerate to the situations that we have occurring now in schools where SROs are being put in dangerous positions, why students are being put into dangerous positions. I was at Bennett High School with Dr. Briggs. There were multiple issues that occurred there in that school and they needed to be addressed. There were days a student did something that was inappropriate and they were right back in my classroom the next day. Did that follow the code of conduct? Possibly. Could it have not followed the code of conduct to a T? That is also possible. Discipline needs to be the focus within our, within our county 
we need to make sure that we are not allowing the students to feel that it's acceptable to portray this behavior day after day after day after day. It's a habit. This is a learned behavior. They're doing it day after day. Therefore, for them, it's becoming acceptable. You have to try to break the habit 44 times. You have to make an attempt to break. Do we have 44 parts to our code of conduct? No. Why are we allowing these students to go through this? Consistency is the key to change. The majority of these students who are receiving disciplinary conduct, they're acting out because there's an underlying issue. How about we give them the services that they need? Are we giving them these um, mental health courses? If there's a student that has an issue, oppositional defiant, whatever their situation may be, are we allowing them the services that they need in the county? Are they visiting with the social workers that every school in our county should have, but it doesn't? We're doing the children a disservice if they're not learning the behaviors and how to correct them at home. They're with us seven hours a day. There's no reason that we cannot give them the services that they need. I know that on the professional days that are upcoming and the one we just passed, that there were multiple schools that offered a mental health awareness to their teachers as part of their professional development. They need to know how to handle these students who are struggling. Can we address the underlying issue? Yes, we can address their situation. The issue with that is, are we giving them the consequence and the full degree of the punishment for the action they are completing? If we do not give them a consequence, they're going to continue to do it again with the thought that it's, it's deemed appropriate in the setting, whether they are at home or whether they are at school. Thank you. Question? Bill? This might be a better one for near the end, but uh, putting on your future hats, um, you know, it's you know, to have a 21st century school system. What uh, you know, ideas would you bring to the table as a school board member that would uh, you know help us move into the next generation of you know education? You know, anything uh, either innovative or trends or you know, ideas that. Uh, you see education moving to in the in the future. Yeah, Donna, you go. Go first. That's fine. Um, I have noticed through <clears throat> my my own situation. Um, I went to college, received a four year degree. Okay, taught in Wicomico County. I'm currently a stay at home mom with a bachelor's in biology. Um, also have all my teaching courses from the MAT program under my belt, as well as a CNA, GNA. I'm currently a stay-at-home mom representing both of my children's schools. Wicomico County does a fantastic job of allowing our students the opportunity to be prepared to attend a four-year university, which I feel is fan it's wonderful that they do that. There is an array of courses that prepare students for this. I feel in the future that we need to tap into the unknown resource of the CTE program. It is something that is most beneficial. The students in our school systems have a broad spectrum of learning, um, learning strategies. Um, some students are hands-on, some students are not test takers. Let's put them in the path of the CTE program. Let's give them a skill. Let's give them the resources that they are going to need to go out and get a job, to be a blue collar worker, to feel successful, to be able to provide for their family and not just think the only way that they can go to college is to go to a four year university. I really think we need to, um, when we do these career days for our high school, we need more CTE schools. We need more technical schools that are on that list. Um, the last meet, parent advisory committee meeting, they passed around a form 
And on that form were all the universities that were going to be at the fair. There was not one technical school listed, not one. Do you know the amazing technical schools that we have in Maryland in our adjoining states? It would be an asset for some of these students who are not prepared to attend a four-year university. I think we need to jump on the CTE program and promoting it. We need to have local business owners that own blue-collar businesses come in. They need to be starting talking to the middle school students. You have, I have a child in middle school. No, he may not be on a four-year university track, but boy, I bet you I could give him something to do with his hands and he would feel successful. I think we need to bring that into the middle schools, start working with them, giving them a track to be based on so that they're prepared when they hit Parkside to attend the CTE program, bring technical schools in when we do our college fairs, and then push these students into an avenue that's going to make them feel successful. Gaines, you know, technology changes everything. As we know, you know, none of us had cell phones when we went to school. So, and now kids, you know, many of them need need, need those cell phones to do their multiplication. And uh, you know, I see the impact social media and, and that sort of thing has had on uh, people's writing skills. It's, they've deteriorated. Um, but as I said from the outset, for Wicomico school system to meet the demands of uh, t the 21st century skills market, job market, workforce requirements, this community has to say, Education is our highest priority. That, that means you members of the county council. That means the county executive. That means the business community. That means the, the uh, people uh, who are administrators and faculty at schools. And it means the school board. And we've got to say this, this is the most important thing that we can do for not only for the kids, but for our community as a whole. Uh, and and if, if we don't do that, then you know, I just think you know, we're, we're doomed to, uh, you know, doomed to me mediocrity. And I get people say, well, you know, we, we don't have the funds and we can't do this, you know. M most of you were around in the early, in the 70s. It wasn't. <laughs> I said <laughs> most of you. Most of you, but you grew up here. So you, you all know the history, you know, many of you know the history of Salisbury State College. That's, you know, when I joined, that institution in 1979. You know, it was basically open admissions. You showed up on the first day of, uh, in se September, whenever it opened, and you walked in and said, can I get in? Sure, fine. You were accepted. Uh, and Dr. Tom Bellavance came in and said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna raise the standards. You're gonna, ha we're gonna strive for academic excellence, and you're gonna have to, be, you know, we wanna, attract the best and the brightest to Salisbury State College. You know, people still call it STC, as you, many of you know, you know, the, the teacher's college. Where could, where could my kid go if they can't in, get into anything, any, any other school? Well, they could always go to Salisbury. And boy, I was there in charge of the promotion end of uh, his marketing strategy, and so I was I feel that many of the qu queries from parents saying, what do you mean my kid can't get into Sal you know, Salisbury State? And so there was a lot of blowback to that uh, effort. But over time, as I s said, you know, we, most of you, when uh, you say, what's, what's so great about uh, Wicomico County? You know, Salisbury University is the top of the list. But that took leadership. Somebody who said, we can become, you know, an excellent, institution. We can, we can prove that uh, higher education in Wicomico County can uh, attract outstanding students, outstanding faculty, and provide, you know, a, a really significant economic boost to the community, although that was, you know, that was <coughs> certainly secondary. So, Bill, that's, you know, what can we do in the 21st century? We can say uh, public school education is the most important thing for us 
and for everybody, not just, not just, not just the kids, for all of us. Josh? We got a presentation earlier from the Maryland Association of Counties regarding the Kerwin Commission. I don't know if either one of you had any quick comments or thoughts on any of the efforts that their state is taking or any of the specific thoughts on Kerwin. It doesn't matter to me who goes first, but any quick thoughts? Or? I mean, I see it rolling in, and, and I, uh, certainly it's, uh, I mean, I haven't studied it to any great degree. It's going to mean more money, but more expectations. Uh, you know, I, I certainly am a believer in, in benchmarks, but uh, that, you know, it's, it's not enough just to dole out money. You need to have, have uh, outcomes, you know, to go with them, but, uh, but there are going to be expectations I, as I read it from on the local level, it's not just the state saying we're going to give you a, a check along with that. So we'll see how it see how it goes. And I'm excited because I believe in the uh, commitment the state has in, in producing you know the, the highest rated school system in the country. We used to have that uh, recognition. We no longer do. So I think that's great for attracting businesses to the state, just as uh, you know, Bill's in real estate. He knows how important it is to uh, businesses, attracting businesses that uh, we would have a reputation as having an outstanding public school system. There are a lot of requirements and expectations that come from the state for the students that are in each classroom. Um, and along with that comes multiple forms and levels of testing. Um, and of course, those expectations have to be met for those funds. The students receive, each school in the county receives a certain amount of funds for these students um, in the county. Now, the only concern and issue that I have with these expectations and requirements to receive the monies is what are we doing for our special education population? Um, our are we meeting them where they are? Are we advocating so that the parents understand what's going on with these requirements? Um, are the special education students being prepared to take these assessments that the county and that their school's receiving money for? Um, and and I, I think that that would be my main goal, would be to make sure that as a parent of a child with a learning disability, who on these assessments struggles. So when you get, you, you get a paper when they're done their testing and it has all these different types um, of bar graphs and charts and, and you see that your child is below level. That's great that the county is receiving this money, but what are we gonna do to bring this child's score up so that they feel successful now that you've got the money? That is my concern is meeting all students where they are and giving them the resources that they need yet again to be scholars in our county. Um, I guess my uh, question is maybe about meeting students where they are, but um, uh, the magnet program has been controversial in the past. What are your two thoughts on the magnet program, I guess? These gains are really Do we mean the program that's currently at North Salisbury yeah, yeah, or do we mean yeah, program. the program? I have actually been a substitute at North Salisbury over there, um, there with um, assistant principal Miss um, Baker. So I have actually been in that building and, and observed some of those classes. Um, those children are working, those children are they are successful, they are. They are excelling in what the curriculum is. Um, there is also the, the program that is now at, um, I just drew a blank. The, 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 the STEM program, the new yeah, STEM, STEM program STEM that has the, the students in there. And the rigor of that program is very, is very difficult as well. We have students from um, Pittsville that were accepted into the program. Um, I feel that it, being a pilot program, needs work. Um, there needs to be um, a certain level of accountability that is all across the board. Um, there are some students that have come back simply due to um, the requirements 
there may be six and seven hours of, of homework over the weekend, as well as two and three additional hours of, of homework in the evenings. Are they learning? Are they excelling? Yes, they are. Are we preparing our students from the mainstream public school to go into these programs? It's a pilot program, it's very hard to tell. Do I think our county needs it? Absolutely, because there are students who are getting left behind in the classroom because they are excelling above and beyond, and then they're, they're becoming complacent. We are not pushing them to the maximum amount of ability that they can do. So I think that these programs are working. I think that like any program in the county or the state, it's going to need to be revised. And I think that that's just going to be a learning process for everyone at this point. Mark, I was actually around when Dr. Evelyn Holman introduced it. <laughs> and it was certainly controversial then because it was a departure from, you know, the uh, previously all students you, sorry. went to classes together and they were, you know, it was pretty much mixed. You know, to be honest, I was, I, I wasn't really crazy about it. Then my son got accepted. And so, well, okay, let's, let's get special instruction. But then I have two younger daughters who came along, uh, went to Fruitland, and they opted, thank you, You're welcome. they opted not to do it, because they had a core group of kids uh, that they, they were friends with, all good students, and so they just went through uh, primary, I guess, intermediate uh, schools in, in Fruitland, and you know, they went on and had uh, very successful high school, college, college careers. I guess I'd have to study it. I'm, you know, I don't know all the details about what, where we are with the magnet program right now. Again, get back to, you know, people like Joe Ollinger saying, you know, you, <laughs> you need to know that you don't know a lot about what's going on in the school system. So I would, before I give, you know, some opinion about something without really uh, uh, immersing myself in the issues that uh, are confronting the program, the pluses and minus, the pros and cons. You know, I pres preserve making any type of overarching mm -hmm. comment about it. Two questions, Mark. Yeah, I um, have a question for both of you. Um, if you get confirmed uh, to the board, do you um, plan on completing the next three and a half years? And if so, do you plan on running for re-election? See how those three and a half years. <laughs> yes, I'm certainly planning on on doing that. And uh, I think uh, Tanya mentioned in her opening remarks something that. that uh, He's speaking to the mic. I'm sorry. Tanya <laughs> Tanya mentioned something in her over, opening remarks, which I concur with. Uh, your district, you know, I know there's uh, I believe four schools: Parkside, Bennett Middle, and the two Fruitland schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I would hope after initial orientation to uh, be visiting those schools, those administrations, those PTAs, and uh, because I, th I think my first priority is to represent the residents of District 3 in, on, on the school board. Not just the students, not just the parents, but, but everybody, because everybody has an interest in uh, a successful sc school system. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, I do that. Um, certainly want to make my contribution uh, to uh, conversations about strategic planning overall. And I know we have supervisory responsibility for mm -hmm. the superintendent. But, yeah, I mean, I need to get to know the schools, the people involved, uh, see how, you know, am I making a difference? Uh, you know, I've been on lots of boards. Mm -hmm. If you've read my remarks. I've, sure. I've been on a dozen boards and had leadership positions and I've stayed on some boards for 12 years and some boards for two years, you know, because if I, I want to make, make sure I'm making a contribution. And I, I've also managed boards and I've had people come on boards who just want to show up and, you know, so mm -hmm. that's not my style. But, you know, I spend three and a half years on the board and then make that decision. 
Well, I'd encourage you to visit all the schools because you're going to be making decisions. Right. I, for I realize all, that. All of them. Yes, I mean, I it's, certainly it would intend to do that, but I think I should, you know, Absolutely. as a District 3 representative, I feel I should, should really as much as possible be an expert on those schools. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, absolutely. If I am selected to fill this position as a potential board member, I would want to implement as many positive avenues and programs as we can into the county, not just for the schools in our district, but other schools. Um, one of my main things that I would love to push forward through for the next three years and then hopefully re-election would be a substitute readiness program which would encompass every single school in Wicomico County. We have substitutes coming in and out of these schools and they are not prepared to be in the schools. They haven't visited them. They don't know the administrators. Um, we, we have a wonderful program here for that. But that's one of my main goals, and I would love to be able to see that through as one of my uh, primary um, <clears throat> things to implement to be effective in our county. And as long as I'm representing the parents, the schools, and the community to the best of my ability, I would plan to continue to run and fill the District 3 position on the board. We, uh, we need to, I think we need to wrap it up. We're about that time. Um, I, I would ask one question and ask you just to keep it very, very brief and start with your time. Um, if we found a million dollars in the budget, what would be your first priority? If we found a million dollars Yeah, if we had a windfall of a million dollars, exactly what would be your first priority? You, you like that to a windfall. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, there, there are certain things that I'm very adamant about. There is a million dollars in the budget. The first thing I would do is make sure that all of our schools are safe. Okay. Gaines? I would defer, you know, the superintendent and the board have already done a lot of research and, and developed priorities. So I'd you know, go to them. They're, they're the ones that have done due diligence on what our priorities should be. That's, I'd start there. Okay. Pretty good. Um, thank you both for being here because it's been a, it's been a, um, Probably a more rigorous program than we thought, a more rigorous process than we thought, uh, starting from day one when you had your interviews and then two public hearings. Two public hearings? Two public. The school board nominating commission. Yeah, two, two public, public hearings, hearings and we meetings with the school board. So, private. Yeah, so I, I know it's been a long road, so we really do thank you for your, for your uh, tenacity and, and uh, putting your hat in the ring. What happens next? We will, um, good Actually, the county council was required to have a public hearing as well. Um, so we'll be scheduling that in the very near future. Um, we are on a deadline. I think we have until um, June the 3rd. June. June the 3rd from the date that um, they, you guys, your names were submitted to us. From the what's what, what's a, pub, mm -hmm. a public yes. hearing in which you, will you not, all discuss? You won't be, it won't be necessary. Uh, again, I, and I was talking to Laura before the, during the break that I think this whole process of public hearings is, is way too way too onerous i think we're going to have to try seeing how we can reduce this some but we'll have a public hearing though for public input it's not necessary for the two of you to be here it's and just probably nobody else will show up either they would just yes, say to us if they, if they if you if they if they felt there was her a family and my family that's right yeah, right exactly. i have a whole little posse exactly. that comes with bring you your fan today. Club. <laughs> so that would be our process we just have the public hearing and we could vote that same day or we could um, defer it to the following meeting okay. But the public hearing will be in two weeks. Though. Oh, no, we have to advertise it. It does have to be advertised. Um, and we do have a lot of public hearings already scheduled for May 7th. I mean, that's the night of mm -hmm. our budget hearing. Yeah. Um, so I'll have to work that out with the council president, and then we'll let you two know. But it'll probably be the first meeting in June. We have to um, approve one of them by June On the first 3rd. meeting in June. By June 3rd. 3rd. Well, then we're, you're going to have to do it in May. What's our time frame? Do we have enough time frame to advertise to do it in, in their second meeting in May? If you do it the May 21st meeting, yeah. then you're having the public hearing and making the approval the same night. <laughs> if we decide to have the public hearing on May 7th, which again, I just mentioned, we have a very busy schedule that night, mm -hmm. um, then you could have the public hearing and then wait till May 21st yeah. Let's do it to make your decision. I think we'll have to do it on the 7th. Yeah. 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 And, and that um, gives us enough time to advertise legally. Right? It does. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll have the public hearing on May 7th. I thought Councilman Dodd was uh, advocating for 
he needs two members representing his district. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, that's 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 Larry. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank thank you all for um. Hey, let me tell you something. I wish we could, because you both are great. Yeah, I've, I've heard you speak before. You're both a fantastic decision. Yeah. But um, thank you all for putting your names forward. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you for stepping up to the plate. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh -huh. you too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. He knows how to get it. <laughs> <laughs> they are over the age of 18. It's been three years. I don't want to leave. I got the road speaker. Thank you so much for listening to us. Entertain a motion to adjourn so we can go to closed session. So moved. Second. Second. Favor?